Well, let's uh, turn this morning to John chapter 1 again. We're going back to the prologue. Uh, we went through the first few verses here uh, of John's prologue, and we're going to make some progress going through the rest of it today. Uh, if you were to spend most of the time in the prologue, you would get most of the themes of the book. Now, we're not going to do that, but we're going to spend a good deal of time today uh, working our way through this. There is one of the lectures that I will give to you uh, over the whole 18 verses that uh, you will try to uh, re-write uh, for me on an exam. So we'll get to that, but that's a little bit later. Now we went through the first five verses. We sh went uh, showing you uh, some of the great themes of what John says concerning Christ and our need to recognize Christ uh, as John represents him. Uh, let's move now to verse 6 to 13. Uh, this is dealing with the ministry of John the Baptist, and it's all very important for John's theme. And uh, John the Baptist comes to our attention in Luke very early. He's there in Ma Mark very early. Uh, obviously, Matthew is starting with the birth narrative, and then uh, we get to John later. But here you have John right after the great statement about Christ. Uh, what a prophet. Uh, what a privilege that John had of proclaiming Christ. And though he was greatly opposed for in his ministry, yet he had a tremendous, powerful ministry in his day. Let's read the, 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 the section here that we're going to look at, and then we'll work through the notes. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. And we'll stop there for just a second. Later on, it talks about him being a burning and a shining light in John's gospel. But he was not that light, referring to Christ. And they would ask him, are you the Christ? And he would say no. And, and we'll, we'll deal with that in a minute. He was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All right, speaking again of the light of Christ. And we already uh, identified that light as referring to the life that was in Christ. He was in the world, now speaking of Christ still, and the world was made by him. There we have creation again, stated about Christ. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The truth about Christ that we looked at earlier is such that it, it brings us into conflict with a lot of so-called Christianity. There is theistic evolution. Well, if you believe what we read uh, at the beginning of John's Gospel, then that's going to bring you in conflict with those that teach theistic evolution. In our day, that's quite popular in some circles. Arianism. <coughs> what is Arianism? Anybody? What was the big heresy of Arianism? All right. Denial of the deity of Christ. Uh, they said he was God, but a lesser God. He wasn't the God. Uh, you have the offspring of the Arians today in, in the teachings of the Jehovah's Witness cult, the Russellites. Uh, they also almost word for word mimic what Arius taught. All right, so an ancient heresy. Uh, if you're taking church history, you're in those first centuries, and it was condemned and put outside the church. <coughs> Sabellianism. Any ideas on that one? The main thing that I'm looking for is that when you came to the Godhead, Sibelius had one person that revealed himself in three different modes. 
So at one point he's, he's revealing himself as the Father, and then he's revealing himself as the Son, and then he's revealing himself as the Spirit. All right. Uh, if you were to go back to the lectures that we were looking at uh, earlier, in the first se section I gave you uh, some literature after this lecture, and uh, see if we can scroll down here quickly. <clears throat> uh, it's not in those notes. Maybe it's coming after. It's the top of this page right here. It's the top of that page. There we go. By exact and careful language, John denied Sabellianism by not saying the Word was the Word, or God was the Word. That would mean that all of God was expressed in the Word, and the terms would be interchangeable having the article. The subject is made plain by the article, the Logos, and the predicate without it, God, and just as in John 4.24. And it doesn't explain a great deal about Sibelius, but we don't have three, one person revealing himself in three ways. We've got three distinct persons. And here you have one person face to face with the other person showing that indeed uh, there's not a, a, a transformation from one mode to another mode to another mode. Uh, the Father is not now revealing himself as the Son and then later he reveals himself as the Spirit. Uh, that is false. There are three distinct persons in the Godhead but one God. Nestorianism. Any ideas on that? Actually, this is going to bring us down to verse 14, away from chapter 1. No, that's the next one, Gnosticism. Nestorius, <clears throat> Nestorius, we're not exactly sure that he taught what is being ascribed to him, but his followers certainly taught this, that there were two persons in Christ. Now, we'll deal with that later. Not one person joining two natures, but two persons, so that each nature had a person. And there was no connection then between the person of the Godhead and the person of the humanity. And as, as I said, we'll go into that uh, a little bit later even today. And then there is Gnosticism. And as was suggested, the Gnostics believed that uh, spirit was good, flesh was evil. And because spirit's good, flesh is evil, Christ could not have a flesh like you and I have. And yet, in verse 14, what does it say? And the Word was made flesh. All right? And that was an ancient heresy that John himself was writing against. Now, theistic evolution, Arianism, Sabellianism, Nestorianism came after John's time. But Gnosticism was right there in John's time. And we'll have more to say about that, especially when we get into his first epistle. Uh, Gnosticism if you know Greek, uh, you know the word genoso. Uh, this is the noun form, basically, of that word being made into a title for a people. Uh, it's a general term then. Uh, this people had a secret knowledge about God. A lot like the cults today, you want to uh, get our knowledge about God, that secret knowledge that you've been cheated out of, you've got to come and join us. And, and so they had this idea. And then one of the main thesis of them was that uh, Christ had an, an ethereal body, uh, seemed to have a body. Docetism uh, was uh, one of the branches of Gnosticism. He had an ethereal body, an unreal body, because if he had a real body, then it, it would be evil. And of course, he was not evil. And uh, John, as I say, when you get into his first epistle, seems to be very strongly combating that Maybe Paul was dealing with that somewhat and, and when he writes to the Colossians as well. Now, these are some of the errors that in church history, uh, just what John wrote combats. And we have a host more error in our day that is combated by those first five verses. Well, God sent a man to bear witness of the light and to clarify that which was being denied. The truth about Christ is he is eternal, self-existent uh, when he made the world. And 
we, we have them in our notes. Uh, let me get there. This statement, he is eternal, self-existent when he made the world. He is the second person of the Godhead who was, to, who was with the one true God. He was truly God in his being so that he is consubstantial with the Father. Have you had that term yet? Consubstantial. He's of the same substance, the same essence as the Father. He is also, we will see, consubstantial with us because he is truly a man apart from sin, but sin is not necessarily a part of man. And so we have him consubstantial with the Father. He is the creator. He made all things with no exceptions. He is the giver and sustainer of life. He possesses life and grants life. Right? That is the light that John the Baptist came to bear witness for or witness to. Now, when you look down through this, we made reference to this yesterday, there are three statements about men refusing the light. Three statements in, in, from verse 6 to 13. In verse 5, it says, The darkness comprehended it not. Now, you're not going to receive the light if you don't comprehend it, if you don't understand it. Uh, if a light equals life, then darkness equals death. Of course, sin causes death. Men are spiritually dead and cannot see nor completely understand that which is spiritual. Theologians speak of mankind as being totally depraved in every aspect of his being. Every aspect of his being is fallen. When you say totally depraved, you do not mean that man is depraved worse than another man. You are saying that in every part of his being he has fallen. His mind is fallen. His will is fallen. His emotions, his so that when you look at man, totally he has fallen. Arminianism, Pelagianism would, would want to leave some part of man unfallen. And, and that God just holds man accountable because it's a part of man that has not fallen. When you look at Scripture, it's very clear that he's totally fallen. All right? And this comes into play then when we, we look at this whole idea of men not comprehending the light. Why don't they comprehend? Because they were in darkness. Now, we're not dealing with Adam as he was created. We're dealing with Adam after he fell. And after Adam fell into sin, every man coming into this world does not comprehend the light. Just doesn't. And this is what John is saying. Here is the light shining in the darkness, and yet man does not, with his mind, heart, and will, comprehend it. Now, the Puritans said this, this sentence means that the natural heart of man has always been so dark since the fall that the great majority of mankind have neither understood nor received nor laid hold upon the light offered to them by Christ. And I would agree with that totally. Paul said, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Then what does he say? There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There are many today who would trumpet there is none righteous, but they leave out the part man doesn't understand either. Man's not seeking God either. Understanding, you're dealing with the mind. Uh, not seeking God, you're dealing with the will. Man's mind, man's will is indeed depraved. And this is what John is saying in a very simple statement here. He's come to bear witness to the light. Why does he need to bear witness to the light? If every man could see the light, he doesn't, God doesn't need a witness. But man can't see the light. It's shining, but his eyes have been put out. And so he cannot see what is shining upon him. And that tells us how dark this world really is when we think of the fact that this light is shining and men do not see it. When you think of the fact that he was then incarnate and walked among men, and the light was continually shining from Christ, as it were. Not the Shekinah glory, but the, the life that he had was shining. And men still didn't understand it. They didn't take it in. It, it tells you how dark the world is. Then you have the statement about men rejecting the light. You see this uh, in 
the darkness refers to us. The comprehending is in the next point of rejecting. Uh, you have the verb here, katalambano. You see that at the bottom of your page. That's what I added to your page. The word means to seize, to grasp, to overcome, to grasp with the mind, to understand. And uh, with that, the world just won't lay hold of it, won't grasp it. Uh, this Greek word comprehend is the same used in Ephesians 3, Acts 4, and is translated there perceive or attain. Uh, apprehend, as is translated uh, later in John 8. Uh, they, they, they just won't comprehend it. It's the word lambano, to take and receive, and then kata, to, as it were, hold it down when you receive it. They're not going to take it in and lay hold of it. So the world is in darkness. How dark is it? The light is shining, and they're not going to take hold of that light and, and, and hold it and, and make it their own. Again, if we read the Puritan notes that I have here, the difference in the tenses of the two verbs used in this verse is very remarkable. About the light, the present tense is used. is continually shining. It shineth now as it has always shown. It is still shining. About the darkness, the past tense is used. It has not comprehended the light. It never has comprehended it from the first and does not comprehend it at the present day. Caralambano. The world does not know the light. Look at verse 10 uh, of the passage that we were reading. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, did not know him. This is the word, genosko, uh, has more than just an intellectual knowledge to it. Uh, there are two Greek words that... Uh, are primarily used to translate, as it were, this idea of knowledge. Gnosko, that's the word before us here. And then uh, oida. Oida oftentimes has to do with the intellectual knowledge, something that you see and understand. Gnosko goes further than that, and it deals with experiential knowledge, more than just the intellectual knowledge. And... Uh, they're obviously synonyms, so that in synonyms there's going to be an overlap to what they are saying. And what you're trying to do in word studies in synonyms is, is you have one word. Let's say this is oida. You have another word, genosko. And you have an overlap here where they're identical. What you're trying to find out is that part of the word that is different. Right? Sometimes one word will in completely envelop the other one. I think you'd have that perhaps with gnosko. Oida would not so much be anything true of oida that would not be true of gnosko. But there may be things that are true of gnosko that are not true of oida. It's a broader term. And uh, John plays much on the distinction between these two words, especially when you get into his epistle. Right? And so, gnosko would be more of an experiential knowledge and uh, oida more of this intellectual uh, knowledge. Oida comes from a root that has to do with seeing something. Do you see it? Do you have it in your mind? Uh, gnosko... Uh, here uh, has the idea they did not recognize it. Uh, they did not have a right relationship with it, according to to uh, Leon Morris. Uh, the lack of recognition was not due to the light, but to the willful rejection by man caused by sin. Uh, again, uh, quoting here from, from Rogers. Let me get rid of this. Uh, <laughs> I 
Our Lord himself said in John 3, This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Then again in John 12, But though he had done so many miracles before them, this is the Apostle John now writing, Yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and spake of him. All right, there is a deadness to hearts of men. Now I think in chapter 12, there's also a judgment on Israel that even goes beyond that. But there is a deadness on the hearts of men that they do not know this light. And there is not this intuitive knowing as some would make us to believe. The Jews do not receive the light. Look at verse 11. Where the first two would deal with all of mankind, I think verse 11 is more limited to Christ. He came unto his, to the Jews, excuse me. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I suppose you could say his own would be, he came to creatures, but I, I would think it's more dealing with the Jews. So in the first two statements about man rejecting the light, it's dealing with all of mankind. But truly when it comes here, it's even getting more specific. And John is saying he came to his own and his own received them not. Right? So man rejects the light. And you have that statement then in verse 5. You have it stated again in, in the fact that they knew him not in, in verse 10 and then you have it stated again in verse 11 that men have an antipathy toward Christ and it doesn't matter that even if they're Jews born physically into the covenant as it were they are still in darkness and they will not receive him now as we move down a little bit further than in our notes it's, it says all men need revelation about the light we need revelation to witness, divine revelation to witness to the light. Now, this revelation came from God in the form uh, of the messenger. Uh, it is interesting that the word apostello is the word behind the idea of sending, the name that would actually be used of the apostles in the noun form. It means to send the noun apostles from the same root. Uh, the perfect passive participle indicates that the perfect was stressing the existing result of the sending. John had been sent, and he was continually, as it were, being sent uh, on this mission from God. Now, our revelation doesn't come in the form of a, of a prophet, prophet giving new revelation to us. It comes in the form of the Old Testament, portraying, uh, picturing, prophesying the coming of Christ, and then the New Testament explaining, expanding, exhorting, concerning the manifested Christ. Men will not come to the truth about Christ without accurate, precision, precise, excuse me, revelation from God. Initially, this revelation was given by the prophets, such as John, and then Christ in the apostolic ministry. The revelation now is recorded in our Bible. We still have apostles and prophets with us. Where do you have them? In the book that you, can, you own, that's before you. I have the prophets. I have the apostles. Don't need a physical guy walking around saying he's an apostle. Have it right here. Up in Traveler's Rest, there was a church, charismatic. And on the sign out front, the man was calling himself an apostle. <laughs> not hardly. Not hardly. Uh, when that church went under, I thought, well, not very good apostle. <laughs> Anyways. Divine revelation is necessary. And then the human instrument is obviously necessary as well. We need human witnesses to help reveal this light to the world. John was not the light. Christ is the only light. The messenger is bearing witness to the light to those blind. And the messengers today are all the believers in the modern world. We're all messengers bearing witness to the light. Now, we, we don't have a ministry like John did. But in a very real sense, that's what I do, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. I am bearing witness to the light. You say, well, people are rejecting your message. They rejected John's message. Right? 
John the Baptist preached. There were people, multitudes that didn't want what he said. Now, there were multitudes that did. Why did some receive and others did not? Now we're getting down to verse 13 uh, and what's spoken to us there. John does tell us why some receive Christ and others do not. But the fact of the matter is, in and of themselves, they will not receive. So God sends a divine messenger with divine revelation. For us, we have that in the form of an inscripturated word. For them, John was giving that word. But John still had to preach that word, and we now continue on in that ministry of preaching that word and showing that light with the hopes that behind the scenes, God's Spirit is going to move. Right? I liken this to when, when David came to Jerusalem and it was run by the Jebusites. He's outside the city walls. And they said to David from the city walls, you know, the blind and the lame will come in here before you come in here. They're mocking him. And then David put the challenge to his men and Joab took that challenge and he conquered Jerusalem by going up the water duck and into the city. Now, the city would be built on a hill. The water would be at the bottom of the hill in the valley. And so they would often... Uh, dig a, a conduit so they could get to the water and bring it in under the wall. And so that's the way that Joab came in. He came up through the water. And then he conquered the city, and then they threw open the doors to David. Well, when you are preaching, you are telling people, you're setting before them Christ. And, and from their hearts, they're saying, the blind and the lame will come in here before you come in here. They don't want Christ. And then the Spirit comes from the inside and conquers the heart and then the doors open wide to Christ and he comes in all right that is truly an analogy of what we do as a preacher we set before them Christ John was bearing witness to the light but John still couldn't save them something had to happen within them and so the Apostle John now tells us what that is and so as a preacher, I know the people are dead. I know they won't take what I'm preaching. I know that the doors are shut and barred. There are times you'll have someone come to your congregation, and they will sit there, and it's just like the gates are barred, and they are challenging you. With their looks, they'll challenge you. And I always find that a great time. Because <laughs> I've got a gospel, and I know that that Holy Spirit can come into the heart and make them throw open the doors as he did in my heart and soul. Right? But there has to be, in the God's order of things, there has to be someone bearing witness to the light. And so as preachers, that is what we do. Now, obviously, when God saves a soul, there's an edification and a building upon what is already there. But when unsaved people come in, and they will come in, if they're just relatives of people you, who come to your church or, or people just off the street, they are going to come in. And when they come in, set before them, don't hide the light. That's what modern preachers are doing. They're wanting to hide the light to make it more palatable. The, the light makes the eyes hurt. So let's turn it down as much as we can so it doesn't hurt so much, and then maybe we can get it into the heart. John didn't do that. He let the light shine. John exposed the light to everyone. He, he told them what the light was with the hopes that the Holy Spirit would come from within and would move and open the doors. Now, I've had some come to me who say that because I invite people to come to Christ, that I'm somehow going beyond Scripture and, and that I am uh, an Arminian. But what you find in Scripture is not only is the light being shown, but the invitation to come to the light is part of the shining of that light. And you'll see that in John. He did invite people to come. He commanded them to repent, uh, especially when you come to the Gospels, uh, the Synoptic Gospels. His baptism was a baptism of repentance. And, and, and when the Pharisees and Sadducees came, he said, Who warned you, brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath to come? And he commanded that they bring forth fruit, meat to repentance. Now, that's the same as commanding them to believe. Because they're two sides of the same coin. 
And so John commanded them to believe. Our Lord commanded men to believe. The apostles commanded the men to believe. At the end of their sermon, there was the application to the heart and the command to believe. So I say that the shining of this light and bearing witness to the light is also part of that, is telling men they must receive this light. And yet they won't do it. He came to his own, his own received him not. John was bearing witness to them, and they didn't receive John's message, many of them. And then we come and we find in verse 12 at the beginning of the verse, but as many as received him. And that leaves you with this question. Men don't comprehend. Men don't know. Men don't receive. And now you got this group that's receiving. Why are they receiving? And I think that then becomes the answer given in verse 13. John is saying, these men that receive were born. That's, that's your answer. They were born. Well, immediately we think, all right, so they were born Jews. No, he's not talking about that. Well, maybe they were born special Jews. Maybe it's Davidic race. They were born of David's lineage. No, he's not talking about that. Well, maybe there's some kind of Gentiles that are saved, that God is, their physical birth has something to do with it. He's just not talking about that. Well, we have in the church those who would tie this birth up to baptism, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, Mormons with adult baptism, Church of Christ with adult baptism. They tie this birth into something that they do physically and that that physical doing then produces a spiritual life. And John says, no, it's not that. They were born, but it wasn't of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. And so when you look at, well, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, what is it? John says they were born of God. That's what's needed. A birth that is of God. Now, John doesn't explain that here. This is still the prologue. But when you come to chapter 3, in our Lord's interview with Nicodemus, very clearly explained. When you come to his epistle, I mean, he, he speaks over and over and over again of what it is to be born of God, right? And, and the characteristics of that birth. All he says here is, those that received him were born of God. And I believe, as far as cause and effect is concerned, verse 13 is the cause of verse 12. Now, some come to me, have come to me and said, well, which comes first, faith or the new birth? Repentance or the new birth? In reality, as far as human perception takes place, they come together. But there's a cause and effect. It is not your faith that causes a new birth. It is a new birth causes faith. This morning I came and I flipped on the switch and the light came. As far as human perception was concerned, it seemed to happen at the same time. But there was really a cause and effect. The light didn't switch, flip on the switch. The switch flipped on the light. There are those who would say, in some reforms, some Dutch reformed men, would say that the new birth takes place and it could be years before they come to faith. Uh, Abraham Kuyper says that. It's utter nonsense. Read John, 1 John 5. Right? The, the fruit of being born is that you believe. You believe. And uh, I had a, there's a man who's a cultic fellow down here in Greenville who was saying this, and it said that the Apostle Paul was born again in his mother's womb. <laughs> well, you, you, you try to plug that into 1 John. John said, if you're born again, you're going to love the brethren. So all this time Paul's fighting with the church, he's, he's born again? Come on, it's nonsense. I had a pastor who graduated from Westminster. He went to Wheaton first, and he told me, he's, and he just died here uh, just a few year, uh, weeks ago, but he told me he believed that there are those who had the spark of faith in them, and they were atheists fighting against it. I thought, you, you, you've lost your mind. But this, that's that whole idea of separating uh, the new birth from repentance and faith. So here's somebody who's been born again, 
and he's an atheist going through the and he's fighting against the new birth within him. That's utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Again, we'll get to first John, but read first John what it says about the new birth. And if you're fighting against God and you're fighting against the believers, you've not been born again. You're still in darkness. You have not had that birth. The birth automatically results in repentance and faith. Now, there may be many things God does by His Spirit, striving with us, as our Lord speaks of in John 16, where the Spirit will come and convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But He has to go beyond sin, righteousness, and judgment. He has to give life. When you're born from God, of God, if you were to read the Westminster Confession, it doesn't tell you what the new birth doesn't describe it, doesn't define it for you. It defines effectual calling because that is something you are aware of consciously, effectual calling. What is effectual calling? Well, you, you see your sin and misery. Your mind is enlightened in the knowledge of Christ. And then there's a renewing of the will. Now, it is that renewing of the will that is the new birth. That is the renewing the will. So you now embrace Christ. So God comes and he shows you your sin and misery. If that's all you have, you're going to hell. And then he enlightens your mind. You see the beauty of Christ. But if that's all you have, you're going to hell. You must embrace Christ. You must come to Christ. You must take him as your own. That's the renewing of the will. At that moment, you truly have been born of God. However, God's Spirit may have been striving with you up to that moment, at that moment when you received him, according to verse 12, at that moment you were born of God. So I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know if I'm born again. And they're being honest. They've heard some glorious statements that somebody has made, and they're looking at their life and they're saying, I don't know if I've had that experience. Am I born again? Had a Years ago when I was a youth pastor, I was speaking with a, a farmer's wife. Very humble lady, a good lady. She says, Pastor, have I been born again? And she was, she, was, she was really distraught, wanting to know. And I said to her, I said, as far as you know, have you repented of everything you know to be sin and come to Christ? Yes. Is Christ your Lord and Savior now? Oh, yes. I mean, she'd be horrified if you accused her of not having Christ as Lord and Savior. She said, yes. And I said, I've got good news for you. You've been born again. The new birth is below the level of consciousness. When you're born, there is, as where the baby is born, there's these outward manifestations. And it's the manifestations that often are, by people, assumed to be what the new birth is, the emotional manifestation, the weeping, uh, other things, the embracing of Christ. It's the new birth that gives you that life, but it's you who actually embrace Christ. This is where Mr. Camping was off, one of his many areas he was off. He made the new birth something that he, he would embrace Christ without knowing it. It's utter nonsense, all right? Let me check here on our time. The embracing of Christ, the receiving of Christ, is the first evidence of the new birth, the life. Now you note that receiving Christ is also parallel here with what? With believing. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Receiving and believing are by John viewed as the same. Some of these folks that were campingites and some of the other Reformed people say you never have to accept Christ. And, and what they mean by that is that they've seen some <laughs> who stress the will of man to the point that is heresy. And they say, well, you know, if, if you say you have to accept Christ, you're an Arminian. Well, this is what receiving is. Receiving and accepting is the same thing. Look it up in your dictionary. Receiving is defined by the word accept, and accept is de defined by the word receive. We're not playing games with words. 
do you have to accept Christ when you're saved? Absolutely. Right? There's no such thing as salvation apart from accepting Christ. And yet there are Reformed writers that would give the impression that you are an Arminian. I had a man at the back of the door of my church. Now he was upset because of something I preached in the realm of prophecy. He was a nut when it came to that. But he decided to try to take it out on me in the realm of accepting Christ. And he said, do you believe you have to accept Christ to be saved? And I said, I do. And he yelled, you're a heretic. I, I looked at him and I said, unless you receive Christ and accept him, you will be damned. You will be. be because that is the gospel. It's not enough you know with intellectually. You must accept. Well, I can accept him. Not unless God gives you power to, but you are still responsible. It's not God keeping you back. It's your sin and love of sin keeping you back. But if you've never received him, then the remedy is still apart from you. And the only thing that's going to heal the sin-sick soul is the remedy of Christ. And if you won't take the remedy, you're going to perish. Right? So here, here the, the birth of God is, is parallel with what? Receiving and believing. We said receiving and believing are parallel. The birth of God is, is, is still in that regard, parallel. The one causes the other. But they're all there in the same individual. And yet sometimes when men start analyzing these things, they focus so much on one thing that they forget the other. And then they end up in an error, great error. And <laughs> some of the, the, the hardest opposition I have had in my ministry has been by reformed people. And I thought when I became reformed, finally, I, I, I'm going to be embraced. And then you have these reformed people, and they're nutty. Dr. Cairns used to call it uh, egghead Calvinism, where, where you know they, they're going outside the bounds of Scripture and coming up with weird things. Right? I am a Calvinist. Westminster Confession is Calvinistic. But I'm a Biblicist. I believe the Westminster Confession because that's what the Bible teaches. I'm not trying to force the Bible into the confession. It's what it teaches. And we have reform writers who are bring, making up doctrine out here and forcing it down on Scripture, and they're every bit as bad as the Arminian who is doing that. We have to let the Scripture speak. And when you do, it's very clear. And when you go back in history, you're going to find that men... Uh, who are the writers like a John Murray or these men were very clear but we have a lot of baggage to overcome in our day so the receiving of Christ has to do with the new birth and uh, for that reason the third point here is that all men need regeneration with the light the regeneration is not controlled by man it is not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. You, will, you said you hadn't had soteriology yet. But you're going to have it. Monergism versus synergism. Urgism. You, you see the, 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 the root going back to the Greek word to work. Right? Moner has the idea of mono one, center two, all right, working with. Biblical Christianity is monergism. Arminianism, Romanism, synergism. Romanism says you must baptize, so you're doing a part, and then God does his part, synergism. For many, that's the way that the altar call is used. You must walk the aisle, you do your part, and then God does his part. You say, well, that sounds pretty strong. Well, I'm thinking of now Charles Finney. Charles Finney said that the anxious bench, the altar call, was the third ordinance replacing baptism. 
Yeah, he actually said that. I'm paraphrasing now, but uh, goofy. When for some people today, you cannot be saved unless you walk the aisle. And so they're waiting for church to come because they know they need to be saved so they can walk the aisle. In that person's mind, walking the aisle has become a sacrament like Rome's baptism is. Now, I'm not saying you can't use an altar call. If you're going to use it, use it correctly and guard the people against this mentality that they have done something that saves them. It's Christ who saves. You just receive the gift. So synergism is wrong. Now, in regeneration, synergism is wrong. It's monergistic. It's all of God. Regeneration is all of God. In conversion, synergism is right. Because conversion takes in more than regeneration. Conversion takes in your repenting and believing. And so conversion is a term that engulfs re regeneration, if, you, if I can put it that way. So speaking of regeneration, it is monergistic, not synergistic. But when we speak of conversion, which is bigger than regeneration, regeneration is God's given you life, period. Conversion is then you taking that life and embracing Christ. You're doing something. That is synergistic. Sanctification. Synergistic. All right? So it's not a bad term. You just have to be careful where you use it. All right? Monergism, regeneration. Synergism, conversion, a bigger picture. Sanctification. Synergistic. God's doing something. You're doing something. They are not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. It's monergistic. Regeneration is from God, which we're born of God. Man must be born of God. He must be born again. We'll get to chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 7. The word again literally means from above. All right? And we'll, we'll see that it's actually translated that way in verse 31. Right, from above. It's a, the Spirit is not controlled by man. Our Lord says that to Nicodemus, chapter 3 and verse 8. The wind blows where it listeth. Right, this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. He blows where he wants. And you, you see the results of his blowing, but you can't control it. And so a man who's born of God is a man who's born not of the will of the blood, or the will of flesh, nor the will of man, nor of blood, he is a man born of God when God's Spirit blows upon him. Now, God's Spirit often blows upon him when the Word is set before them, when Christ is set before them, when someone is standing before them, shining, or as it were, exposing the light, if you might say it that way, taking the blinders away from the eyes, as John the Baptist did. And, and that's what you do as a parent. Every day we were showing this to our daughter, giving her the gospel. We were praying for her to be saved. She was praying for her to be saved. You know? And I would ask her, I said, well, has, has he done it yet? And uh, she would say, not yet, Daddy. And then one day on her own, she's five years old, in her bedroom, she prayed and God did something in her heart. <laughs> we know he did something in her heart first. But she had, a, she had an experience with God. She came out sighted. It was 10 o'clock at night. She wanted to call Dr. Cairns and tell him because he was her pastor. <laughs> right? The very next prayer meeting here, the five-year-old, she prays in the prayer meeting. I mean, just God did something in the heart. Now, you know it later when she becomes an adult and she's still trying to walk with the Lord. You know that there truly was something done. And there are many battles along the way. But there was something done in the heart. What, I, what I'm saying is, you keep putting before your child Christ and the gospel, inviting them to come, inviting them to take Christ, inviting them to repent, sometimes forcing them to repent as far as sins go, but you can't force them to come to Christ, make them come, but you can plead with them, you can, you can put it before them. Well, what if I get a, a non-elect saved? <laughs> That's some Calvinists are so... Paisley used to say, if I get one of the non-elects saved, God will forgive me. You know? <laughs> I don't know who the elect are, do you? 
I think my daughter is. I'm going after her. I'm praying for her. But I don't know who the elect are. But I know he can bring her in. And I can tell you, our home changed the day she was saved. And all the people in that home were now saved. We had an unsaved person in that home to that day. And then it changed. And I'm not saying that she hasn't battled with sin. Her daddy battles with sin. Her mommy battles with sin. But what are you doing? You're, you're, you're exposing the child to the light. I've had people say, don't allow your children to pray till they're saved. What nonsense. I told my daughter to pray. I let her. I had encouraged her. It's your turn to pray. Thank the Lord for the food. Right? I want her talking to the Lord. You know, because she's going to talk one day, and he's going to hear as far as salvation goes, and he's going to bring her into the kingdom. This thing where we put barriers up. Don't let her talk because she's not saved yet. I don't see that in Scripture. What is my job? It's like John the Baptist. It's to bear witness to the light and to command people to come, encourage people to come. Uh, our Lord didn't keep the little children away. He encouraged the people to bring the little children to him. Right? And we do it as parents. We do it as preachers. We do it as an evangelist. If I knock the door and I ask something about going to heaven, if I never get to preaching Christ, that then they're rejecting me for something that has nothing to do with the gospel. I had, had a friend who, who, who went down to a place where there was sin, and he preached against the sin. I said, I have no problem with doing that. I've done it myself. And probably before I die, I will do it again. But I said, did you tell him anything about Christ? If you're not shining the light, or the light is actually shining, if you're not, as it were, witnessing to that light, then what have you told them? They already know they're sinners. They already know they're condemned. They may fight with you about whether that's sin or not, but they know they're condemned. This is the problem I have uh, oftentimes with political uh, issues. I'm against abortion. Spent two and a half years standing out in front of an abortion clinic here in town when I was here. So, so I'm against abortion. Haven't been to jail for it yet, but I don't think I need to go to jail uh, because I'm against it, but I'm against it. But in, in Republican circles, they, they want you to be against abortion, but when you have to give the actual thing that's going to help people who've had an abortion, you can't give it. Because that's religion. We don't bring that in here. I'm sorry that I'm not coming in here. I, I'm called to bear witness to the light. And that will mean preaching against sin, like John the Baptist did to Herod. But it also means witnessing to that light who Christ is and what he has done. And you and I have to be very careful. You can preach on repentance, as I heard a man do. I was driving here, listening to the radio. man wasn't preaching here. He's some other, uh, other state, but it was being recorded and played on a, on a station. My brother-in-law and I were there, and he says, isn't this guy great? And he was preaching against sin, naming sin, and, and blasting it. And uh, we, we listened to maybe 40 minutes. There wasn't one thing he said you and I would disagree with. He probably said it better than I could say it. But I, I said to my brother-in-law, I said, the, the problem with his message, he hasn't preached the gospel yet. He hasn't said anything about Christ. I said, now you listen. And you tell me tomorrow, because we were breaking up, he was dropping me off. I said, you listen and you tell me tomorrow if he ever says anything about Christ other than inviting people to come forward and they'll tell him about Christ in the, in, in the inquiry room. So he came, he came to me the next day, it was Sunday, and picked me up. We were going to church. And he said, you're right. He never really said anything about Christ until it came to the point of inviting someone to come to the inquiry room. I said, yeah, he made people feel bad, so bad they would walk an aisle, and then they would be told how to be saved once they came to the inquiry room. 
I said, show me that in the book of the Acts. Okay, now, now I'm, I'm a, what he said about sin, I've, I'm in 100% agreement with. And I'm not criticizing that. What I'm criticizing is we've gotten to the point that as long as they come down the aisle, it doesn't matter what we tell them. John wasn't that way. He was bearing witness to the light, and the spirit within was bearing witness to the light. So you had two witnesses, the one without and the one within. And the one without won't work without the one within, and truly the one within won't work. If the person has no knowledge of Christ, what does the new birth do? Who's he laying hold of? You have to have both. Our part, as far as preaching goes, is to bear witness to the light. But God must come. It's not a Sunday goes by that I don't pray for the moving of God's Spirit when I preach. Because if, I, if he doesn't move, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And we are to pray for the moving of God's Spirit. We better stop here.